Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, my name is Robin Mundy, and I'm a fiction writer. The project uh, that I'm currently writing is a literary novel, and it's set on remote Matsaka Island off the southwest tip of Tasmania. Matsaka lies in the grip of the Roaring Forties. It's subject to lashings of gales and storm, and its weather station records 300 days of rain each year. Matsaka houses Australia's most southerly lighthouse and in 1997 was the final lighthouse in Australia to be automated. So picture this, it's two years after automation, you're 16 years old, your name is Stephanie and five years ago you lost your twin brother in an accident. So it's just you and your parents and your family is held together by grief. Your mother takes it upon herself to arrange for she and you and your father to spend five months on Matsaka Island as caretakers and weather observers. She grew up on Matsaka Island as the daughter of a lightkeeper and she has a blinkered memory of an idyllic girlhood there. You begrudgingly say goodbye to your best friends, to the most important year of school, to your whole existence in Sydney and you arrive on Matsaka Island to find that you've been hoodwinked. There is no mobile phone coverage. There is no internet, no television, not another living soul on the island. Just you and your parents, a weather station, an old lighthouse and 800,000 mutton birds. <laughs> the island is a fortress. There's not a single beach and the Southern Ocean perpetually pounds against its cliffs. It's cold and it's windy and it rains and rains and rains. You hate this place, except for the old lighthouse and its connection to your grandfather and the old lightkeeping days. Now meet Tom, a 19-year-old deckhand on his brother's crayfishing boat. The boat works around Matsaka Island and Tom visits the island and he befriends Stephanie. The trouble is, Tom is not all that he seems. He fears the ocean and he knows that one day it will claim him. He unwillingly helps his brother steal from other people's cray pots and destroy their belongings. All the other fishermen know that these two are dodgy operators and sooner or later, Stephanie will realise it too. So my novel follows the journey of this cast of dislocated characters during their months of isolation on this island, an experience that shapes them and their futures. So what makes a novel, indeed any creative work, the outcome of research? My field research included spending four months, months on the island as a volunteer caretaker and weather observer, just myself and my partner Gary, and like Stephanie, I learned to translate the sky and the ocean I researched Australia's lighthouse history, interviews with children of lightkeepers, particularly the closing era when these lightkeepers knew that their time was drawing to an end. I've learned about the traditional Nidwani people, the traditional landowners, whose women paddled out to Matsaka Island to dive in frigid water for crayfish and abalone. And I can tell you plenty about the crayfishing industry through interviews with fishermen and the marine police. The struggles and hardships, the camaraderie in this very blokey industry in which men risk their lives frequently. I can detail the important field research that I still need to do in order to finish writing my novel. But although this research is absolutely critical to being able to write about Matsaka Island in a way that's credible, and in fact, this island has never appeared in contemporary Australian literature. This novel is a first, the island and its history. To actually discount a, th a, a different paradigm of, <coughs> excuse me, paradigm of research would be to do my project a disservice. What I do is called practice-led or performative research in which the actual writing, the actual creativity, is the principal research activity. The importance of the performative research at the heart of this novel in, is in that it explores us, the Australian identity and our connection to a vast 
uh, wild coastline. Thank you.